And bonjour, hi, Canada. I'm Hugh Hewitt in the Relief Factor studio inside the Beltway. We have one week to go until Election Day, and I can think of no one better to talk about where we are than Byron York. He's the Washington Examiner's chief political correspondent. He is also a Fox News contributor and a regular guest on my show. Good morning, Byron. It's almost over. I hope you're as relieved as I am that it is. Good morning, Hugh. We're, we're getting there. All right. I, I want to begin with data. Then I want to begin to go to vibes. Then I'm with feelings of doom and predictions. So, first of all, data. I don't know if you follow Michael Purser. Do you follow Michael on, on X? No, I don't. He's a very good data guy, and his data shows the 40,000 vote return lead of Republicans in Nevada, a good turnout for Republicans in Pennsylvania, Democrats lead there, and his conclusion that the R plus one to three electorate is tracking well, that that was the prediction, and it's showing up in the early voting in Georgia, North Carolina, and in Nevada. What does that tell you if he's correct about his data and his electorate? Well, it tells you Trump's going to win in that case. Uh, I mean, this has been the the whole question. I mean, we know that Trump needs to win all the states that he won in 2020. He needs to start there. That includes North Carolina, which he won. Uh, And then he needs to win Georgia and probably Arizona. And then then if he could do that, he could win either any one of Pennsylvania, Michigan, or Wisconsin, and he would win because – Harris, if, if Trump can win Georgia and Arizona, Harris is going to have to win all three of the Rust Belt states, Georgia, excuse me, uh, Pennsylvania, Michigan, and Wisconsin. So uh, I would say that those early signs uh, would be good for Trump. Now, the, the whole problem with, with the polls is we know they were wrong in 2016. They undercounted the Trump vote. We know they were wrong in 2020. They undercounted Trump again. They've tried to fix things. Now, if they actually have fixed things, then the race is just absolutely tied and we can't tell anything. But if they have not, if they make the same mistake that they made before, that is they undercount the Trump vote, you can look at the polls, add two points for Trump, and he wins. So we just the, – the question right now is we're all talking about the polls. Everything we say is based on our reading of these polls, and we don't know if they're right. And I know I really I have some uh, sympathy for pollsters. I don't think Trump people talk to pollsters. This is a, right. uh, a, a an embedded disability. It's not a mistake. It's a handicap. It's something they yeah. can't overcome. And I really I feel bad for him in that regard. But now let's go to vibe. New York Times headline: Trump team fears damage from racist rally remarks. Actually, I don't think they fear damage from racist rally remarks. The remarks were horrible, tasteless, offensive, and uh, I'm sure Puerto Ricans and their friends did not like that. And our three million fellow citizens were no doubt not going to go to any of the uh, Tony, Kill Tony uh, shows from now on. But I also think it's non-consequential when it comes to vote when people's economic and security lives are on the line. What do you think? Yeah, I, I tend to agree with you. So I was at the at the garden uh, for the rally. It was pretty uh, it was a pretty epic event actually. And before it all happened, before the speakers even started, I uh, spoke to uh, this is this is like right out of a poll. I spoke to two 30 year old uh, Hispanic men from um, uh, from New Jersey. One of whose uh, family had come to the United States from Puerto Rico. New Jersey from Puerto Rico, and one uh, whose family had come from the Dominican Republic. And so we actually walked through their becoming a Republican. Uh, By the way, it happened about when Trump first ran in 2015. Uh, And then they're coming to support Trump. They were initially skeptical, which is a a common theme of of conversion stories. They were skeptical. And then (laughs) after Trump was attacked so much in press back then, they began to wonder about him and looked him up and began to say that he was right. Uh, so they are, are Trump supporters. So after we talked about all of this, we parted. And when the um, the floating island of garbage thing happened, I texted them. I said, well, you know, what do you think? Um, and one of them said, the one who's, whose family had come from Puerto Rico, said, look, I don't like it. But this is 
this is insult comedy. It kind of works on insulting everybody. And it's just not going to matter in terms of people deciding their votes. Uh, and then the other one uh, said, well, listen, I actually have heard uh, Hinchcliffe before. I know his thing. This is the kind of stuff he does. And it's not going to have any effect on anything uh, in the Hispanic community. Now, that's two people. But they were absolutely not um, offended in the sense that it would affect their vote. You know, what's interesting about that, Byron, is if the New York Times reporter had talked to those two men, I still think they would have written the same story. Because this joke is like a log in a river when a drowning man or woman just grabs on to anything they can. And I think but you have to remember the initial headline for the, the first uh, right of the story in the New York Times had the headline, quote, Trump at the Garden, a closing carnival of grievances, misogyny, and racism. And that was the news account of the New York Times. If they're trying to get me to cancel my subscription, they're getting close because it's <laughs> just a rag. I do like Shane Goldmacher, and so I, I read it for Shane. Let me now go to Club Shay Shay. Have you listened to it, Byron? I have not listened to it. I've I've read about it, and you know I, I have to say that this this election, I'm learning about podcasts and things that I never knew existed, uh, and this is another one. <laughs> So okay. I'm going to hit you with four quick clips, and then we're going to come back to it during the break sure. and in segment three and four. Cut number 10, Kamala talking about her record on the border. I put my record up to anybody in terms of how strongly I feel about having a secure border mm -hmm. and making sure that there is not that kind of trafficking into America. Cut number 11. And we stand then in that path knowing that we also have the honor and the duty of excelling in every way possible, being able to see what is possible and not be burdened by other people's limited ability to see the same. Cut number 12. I try to share with young people to remind them that you cannot ever be burdened by other people's limited ability to understand who you are. Like, don't let their limited ability burden you about your own ability, you know? Cut number 13. My point is, we got to strengthen the border, and we need to have an immigration system that is fair and humane and strong in terms of making sure that people have to earn citizenship, they have to work hard to get it. My plan includes also strengthening what we need to do in terms of you know, illegal entry in between ports of entry. And my favorite, cut number 14. But what he would do that is about eliminating or reducing the ability of corporations to require, be required to pay overtime, overtime pay. So you would have you could work and the corporations wouldn't have to pay you for it. For overtime. Who worked for free? That's right. <laughs> and overtime Did you know that Trump was going to make you work for free, Byron? I had no idea. This, that one's news to me. Um, you know, and... and you play, you, two of those clips you played were about the border, uh, and it's you know it, this is a um, this is kind of a, a trash talking uh, approach that that she has taken uh, since the first day because she knew when, when her campaign started, however well prepared or unprepared she was, uh, she knew that this was an enormous uh, weakness for her. It was an enormous liability for her campaign. Uh, and so she's just come out and said, I've done a great job. I put my record up against anybody. <laughs> and I, yeah, I think most Americans uh, see that for, for what it is, which is just trash talking. Now, you know, compare this with the Joe Rogan three hour. And I talked with yeah. the uh, Ruthless podcast about this yesterday. It was an epic display of ease. All right. Donald Trump is comfortable in his own skin. Uh, Rogan talks to him like no one can talk to a president. I mean, I'm, I'm astonished. What did you make of that? Well, I thought that um, we've seen some, some reporting on this. Politico actually did a pretty good article on it, which is that Trump and Vance have made uh, very, very good use of podcasts uh, this uh, election season, and especially ones that appeal to male listeners. And obviously we see a huge gender gap uh, among males in Trump's favor 
it's pretty much the same size as the gender gap uh, on the uh, female side in favor of uh, of Harris. So I thought that the Rogan was the biggest and best example of that. I mean, shortly when I when I was listening to Rogan before that, I listened to a uh, performance that Vance did on a podcast with a guy named Theo Vaughn. Uh, and it, it was, was fabulous. Uh, he, and Rogan's got was, 40 million downloads of that episode now. 40 million. I'm back with Byron York, and I'm going to ask him to interpret another portion of the Club Shay Shay interview between Shannon Sharp yeah. and Vice President. Mm-hmm. This is cut. This is cut number four, Byron. I want you to listen to it and then tell me what are they talking about. Cut. Polls suggest that voters trust President Trump, former President Trump, more on the economy. Um, what can you tell the voters, our viewing audience, our listening audience, that if you were to become president, while Madam VP Kamala Harris will be much better on the economy than what President Trump was? Well, so I'm really glad you brought that up, Shannon. So first of all, let's clear up certain myths. Okay. You know those checks that went out? Yes. Those skimmies? Right. <laughs> right. The stimulus check. Yeah, I know. <laughs> well, right. Yes. Yeah, you, yes. <laughs> we got to be full. Stimulus, but they call them stimmies. Okay. <laughs> Um, what is that, Byron? Well, th- this is a way to uh, for for her to criticize what she says is Trump's vanity, because uh, when a stimulus check went out during the during the COVID uh, situation in the Trump administration, he wanted his signature to be on them. Uh, but what it's actually interesting is is it's kind of connecting the fact that you get a check from the government. It's really the taxpayer's money. It wasn't Donald Trump's money. It's the taxpayer's money, which is interesting because all of her economic proposals are based on giving more people more money. Uh, The child care. We're going to come to that. We're going to come to that. So it makes no sense for her to make this argument. But listen to it. it, That's what this interview is just so incoherent. One more cut, cut number seven during the break. Kamala, on, remember, she co-sponsored Medicare for All with Bernie Sanders. That is yes. something she deliberately did as a senator. She co-sponsored it. Cut number seven. Is Medicare for All a priority for you? What is a pri- No. What is a priority no. for me <laughs> is making sure that... No, no. I've got nothing to do with Medicare for All. That's not me. What? Can she run away from that? Well, she spent the whole campaign doing that. I mean, she spent the whole campaign running away from uh, from many of the positions she took when she first ran for president, like favoring taxpayer-funded transition uh, treatment and surgeries and hormones for illegal aliens who were imprisoned. It, that sounded so wild that when Trump mentioned it in the September 10th of debate with Harris – that a number of people on the left just assumed that Trump had made up the craziest sounding thing he could think of and thrown it at Harris. And they they actually didn't want to know that that it was in fact true and that Harris had in fact signed a document, uh, I believe with the ACLU, saying that she supported that. So uh, much of her campaign has been like a hundred yard dash away from the position she held uh, running for president the first time. And here's what's worrying me, is that Donald Trump in 2016 said so many things that so many people thought were so outrageous or divorced from reality or contradictory that he couldn't possibly win, and then he won. So if Kamala Harris wins, she will do so on the same record of incoherence that Trump compiled in 2016. Or if it it just, does that worry you at all, that it's a replay of 2016, but this time the Republicans are set up to hit, to you know, face plant? Well, I think we can say that if Kamala Harris wins, it is because of Democratic voters' deep antipathy and enthusiasm for voting against Donald Trump. I mean, it's just Amen. absolutely clear. That will be, it will not be a, a Kamala Harris win, just like 2016 had a lot to do with the distrust of, of uh, Hillary Clinton. I'm coming right back with Byron because I got to play Kamala talking uh, economics with Shannon Sharp. Welcome back, America. I'm Hugh Hewitt. Byron York is still with me. Uh, Byron, I want to play for you Cut 23. This is the condensed Kamala Harris plan on the economy 
that she gives to Shannon Sharp in the Club Shay Shay podcast that dropped yesterday, Cut 23. Do you Would you want to touch on some specific things you would like to do to keep it because the economy seems to be heading in the right direction, but the inflation, gas prices are extremely high, groceries are extremely high, this rent, I mean, it used to be when I was renting, they moved the rent up $40 a year. Now they're moving it up 400 to So let's talk about that. I, I'm glad you raised that. So, for example, what, let, groceries, yes, the prices are still too high. You know what I know. It. Yeah. Part of my plan is to deal with price gouging. I did it when I was attorney general. I'm going to do it as president, which is these companies that will jack up the prices of groceries to take advantage of people in need and mm -hmm. in particular during a crisis, like what like you see around minute. the pandemic or Hurricane yes. Helene. Yes. Milk. Right? Yes. Milton, mm -hmm. right? So there's that. In terms of housing, first of all, we know that black families are 40% less likely to own their home. Mm -hmm. And we can go back to redlining. Mm -hmm. We can go back to, to policies that were by law or practice meant to not give black folks equal opportunity to home ownership, especially in certain neighborhoods. We can go back to what happened around the GI Bill. Yeah. And we're, when, when all those, the great generation we call them, came back, and there was federal policy to say, you all fought for our country. We're going to give you a boost around helping you buy homes. But those black servicemen, and it was mostly men, those black servicemen did not. So you had then a time when there was a boost. Mm -hmm for it ended up being not for black service members. So part of my policy is to one, create a, a fund so that we will give a $25,000 down payment to first time homeowners to just help people get in the door. We will deal with the rent issue because part of what we're seeing in Atlanta in places across our country is these corporations are buying up all these properties. Mm -hmm which means then that they don't have to deal with competition between the properties and they're jacking up rent costs. So it's about also going after- Byron, your reaction to that two and a half minutes of economic talk? Well, um, evil corporations have been a main player in democratic economic thought for a very long time. So that she's just continuing. She's continuing the work of like Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren. Um, and many others. Now, the price gouging thing is interesting because in her, the very first days of her campaign, which was kind of a surprise campaign when she is quickly made the Democratic nominee after Joe Biden pulls out, uh, people do want to know what she's going to do about inflation, and she comes up with this price gouging thing. And there's, there's a, an, an in, uh, a, a across the board negative reaction to it from, from liberal economists economists from Democrats or from everybody saying well, you know that's not the problem with the inflation that took place uh, in the Biden years and uh, that and there are actually laws some state laws against price gouging which is like when a hurricane happens and the gas station starts charging twenty dollars a gallon because gas is so precious that's price gouging what happened yeah. in, in, in the in the Biden inflation, at grocery stores, because grocery stores have extremely narrow, small margins of, of profit, uh, was something completely different. And yet she's just stuck to it, um, because I, I think that if she tries to come up with some other solution, it would be to admit uh, that she and Joe Biden, by pumping literally unnecessary trillions of dollars in federal spending, uh, fueled the inflation that took place in the Biden years. Do you think the electorate understands that her answer on corporate ownership of some rental houses does not have anything to do with the cost of housing going up? It ju it's just invented. I've never heard anyone make this argument before. A new house is a new house. More supply lowers the cost of everything. It's one housing market. It's like economic illiteracy. Yeah. The, well, again, I would I would I would go back to evil corporations because they do. If you listen to her, everything that's bad in the economy is evil corporations are these big corporations, and we need to regulate them and tax them, and that's what I'm going to do. All right. When we come back, I'm going to talk with Byron one more segment during the break to get his overview. Someone's going to write a book about what's going on in the Harris campaign for the last. Um, I guess it's 10 weeks now since Biden dropped out. Maybe it's 12. Because I think it's really one of the most unusual moments in my life in American politics. 
and she has not met the moment. I don't know if she's going to win or not, but she has definitely not met the moment. Welcome back, America. I'm finishing up with Byron York now. Byron, this has been an extraordinary campaign, unlike any campaign. I first got involved in 76 on behalf of Jerry Ford. I was on the wrong side of Ford Reagan. I was for Ford in the in the primary. So I've been going through in my mind every candidate since then. I think Kamala Harris is the worst candidate of every candidate I've covered um, that made the finals. All right, there have been some... Uh, we got to remember the former governor of New Mexico was out there for a while, too, and we got Dennis Kucinich. There have been some bad candidates, but she's really a bad candidate. What do you think the tell-all books will tell us when they tell all? Yeah, I think she's she's the worst nominee. I think that's what you were saying. The, yeah. the worst person who actually gets the nomination. And there's a reason for that, which is that she didn't get her nomination uh, the regular way that it's done. And uh, you remember... In 2019, her uh, presidential campaign flamed out because she was such a bad candidate. And the key thing to remember here is Democrats in the Democratic primary could uh, reject Kamala Harris and then pick another Democrat, right? They could say, oh, well, I think Cory Booker is better or I like Joe Biden or, you know, whatever. But they had other Democrats to pick, so they didn't support her at all. She didn't make it even to 2020. Now, because of the process in which she was essentially handed the nomination by a, a group of shadowy Democratic power brokers who pushed Joe Biden out of the race, she gets the nomination without that primary process. Democrats have nowhere to go, so she is the nominee. And so I, I think that, that that's, there's kind of a structural reason for them having such a bad nominee because – being the vice president of the United States and being the sitting vice president of the United States, Joe Biden's constitutional successor, if something were to happen to him, I think that gave her uh, an unbeatable uh, advantage in when it came time to push Biden out of the race. Now, I want to ask a question that's infrequently posed, and it's a guess. But you've been everywhere. You've been more places. You and Drucker go more places than anyone I know. Are there Democrats who are mad about Biden getting thrown under the bus? Uh, are there Scranton Joe supporters out there who are just going to stay home because they tossed Joe under the bus? Well, I think there's incipient Democratic disappointment. <laughs> but, I mean, obviously, if she loses, a lot of people are going to say, well, that was a bad idea. I mean, it all depends on whether she wins or she loses. I mean, you're talking about writing this book about uh, about this race. I mean, it, it's it's a totally different book if she wins. Uh, all is forgiven. It was a great idea. And if she loses, there's going to be a lot a lot of second guessing. And this was, uh, it's hard to emphasize how extraordinary what took place was when this, and we still don't know the story of exactly how it happened, but when this group of power brokers, maybe led by Nancy Pelosi, certainly including Barack Obama, managed to put the squeeze on Joe Biden and get a sitting president to pull out of the race for reelection. I mean, this is absolutely unprecedented. Leaving and us effectively without a president. This is why Netanyahu feels free to attack Iran, and I'm glad that he did. But there is, we are effectively without a president. They neutered Joe Biden when they tossed him off the ticket. And we are in an uncharted political moment that I think will be, I don't think there's a president anything remotely like this before. And it's coming home to roost, I think, for Democrats. So Byron, who is going to run, on based on your reporting, uh, Trump's White House for him? Who's his chief of staff going to be? Because to me, that's really the crucial oh, moment. Yeah, I, that's that's a um, a good question. Um, there are, there, you know, there's well, there's a fair amount of speculation about it. Um, I would not count out. I'm not saying I would. So I'm saying it's going to happen. I would not count out uh, Kevin McCarthy in this. Um, he is obviously he was rejected by the by the small group of, Demo of Republicans in the House. But he's probably the most organized person I've ever met in my life. I mean, uh, he approaches a problem and learns absolutely everything about it, knows everybody involved, and then goes from there. So um, extraordinarily organized person probably would do a good job. I, I think. Boy, we would be blessed as a country if Kevin McCarthy was the chief of staff. Because he doesn't, the only axe he carries has got Matt Gates's name on it. And so we can, that's the that'd only. Be fine. Yeah, that'd be fine. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> the sacrifice that would be made. Byron York, always a pleasure. 